Uh, I work at Libreria Proyección, which is a bookstore and social center downtown in Santiago. We have uh, a bookstore, uh, but also we have some rooms for the community, for political, social, cultural organizations, feminist groups, artists, everyone. And I'm also part of uh, Periódico Solidaridad, which is a newspaper, an anarchist newspaper, which covers m mostly, uh, basically, uh, workers' struggles and the student movement and also struggles in the communities. And we try to give uh, an anarchist perspective, also political analysis about what's going on in Chile. Do you want to introduce yourself and then yeah. we'll start? Yeah, well, I am Gabriel. I am a militant of the Libertarian Center Front. What the Libertarian means is something very different from the U.S. Um, basically, being anarchist, and as not only in Chile, but also in the whole other America and the whole world, except here, where it's very um, I've been participant since 2004 in different student struggle, and I'm also part, or was part, of the muralist brigades. And some photos we are going to show you the Unidad Muralista Luchadora Ernesto Miranda. So, I hope you like this presentation. I'll leave it with Melissa. Um, I'm Melissa. Uh, I'm part of La Alzada, Acción Feminista Libertaria, an anarcho feminist organization in Santiago, Chile. And later I'm going to talk uh, about a little bit about where we do. Uh, let's start with the beginning. Okay. Yeah. I was part of the Libertarian Student Front. I always forget to say, forget to say this, but uh, I, had, uh, I was lucky to be there in the big mobilization of 2011. We're going to talk about that too. So. Maybe you've heard about the student mobilization uh, that happened in 2006 in Chile with high school students occupying their schools. Maybe you heard about uh, the mobilizations in 2011, which were huge. We had hundreds of thousands of people out in the streets uh, demanding free public education. Maybe you've heard or read about the port dock workers striking in Chile throughout the entire coast. Um, maybe you know something about Chile or, or what's happening right now and this social conflictivity that has been on the rise for, I don't know, 10, 15 years it's, we need to understand it in its context and to understand what's happening in Chile right now to understand the grievances of the students and the workers and the communities in Chile we need to review the legacy of the dictatorship we had from 19, 1973 until 1990. Because it is the neoliberal and repressive legacy of the dictatorship uh, that it's the, the basis of the current situation of the labor and the student movement in Chile. First of all, the most basic thing, state terror. Many students that were organizing their schools and colleges and universities Many labor organizers or uh, union leaders and just common workers and peasants and, and neighbors were kidnapped, tortured, assassinated, disappeared, sexually abused or forced to exile from 1973 even after 1990. Uh, and this was just one of the ways that the dictatorship and the ruling class in Chile had to confront and, and try to deactivate the social movement that had been very active in the 60s, since the 60s. But we also have to take into account the neoliberal program that was implemented by the ruling class in Chile, um, not just to demobilize a very militant working class, but also to confront the international crisis of the 70s and the 80s. That's, it's not a, a lesser point to understand that neoliberalism in Chile is not just the evil plan of the U.S. government to implement, to impose capitalism in the rest of the world because capitalism, capitalism was already there before U.S. imperialism uh, and the ideas of neoliberalism had been in the air uh, before, before the 70s. Uh, but it's mostly a natural, natural uh, way of, for capitalism to answer, to respond to the crisis in the, after the, the boom of the World War II, after World War II. But, of course, uh, our national bourgeoisie is responsible for that, but they had some help from their friends here at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, some important 
uh, transformations in the economy in Chile. First of all, the privatization of the public services, such as water, electricity, publicly funded housing, uh, health care, the pensions funds. They were all privatized and fell in the hands of corporations that were, of course, oriented by profit and not the satisfaction of popular needs. And this, this way, the dictatorship could at least attempt to destroy any sense of community of the Chilean people and also any type of uh, social safety net that existed in Chile. But also, it's important to consider the reorientation of the economy towards the exploitation of natural resources. Chile is basically a country that exports whatever uh, raw materials we can extract from the mines, from the land, uh, from the ocean and the forest. And that means that our economy is basically uh, oriented towards the external markets, which makes Chile a rather uh, dependent economy and a very weak economy, since we depend on the crisis or recession of, of uh, other countries. If, if China, for instance, which buys 40% of our copper, goes into a crisis or a recession, then we are in big trouble. And 80% of the gross domestic product in Chile is made up of uh, exportation of raw materials. But also, not, not only they privatized the public services, but they also created new markets in areas that were not, uh, in, that were not available for, for the capitalist market. Housing, education, healthcare, and including the transformation of peasants into agricultural uh, workers in capitalist firms. This means that they basically m they made the public school system, the public healthcare system, go into competition with the private clinics or the private hospitals or the private uh, schools and universities. That way, the market will self-regulate. The, uh, according to the, the options in the elections of the family. Right. <laughs> that works very good. So, the, and also the transformation of peasants into agricultural workers, it's also very important because it had a deep impact in the housing problem of the 90s and the, and the 2000s in, in Chile. Because many people moved from the countryside to the cities looking for a job uh, and for, for somewhere to live. This means that the dictatorship was successfully able to extend the capitalist logic of profit to almost every domain in society, in Chilean society, having a severe impact in the ways of life of the Chilean people, but also the way they conceive themselves now more as individuals and consumers rather than members of our community. And it's also crucial to understand that after the dictatorship, things didn't change much in Chile. In 1988, Pinochet is voted out of office through a national referendum, starting a process that we know as the transition to democracy, but we also know that we also know as the transaction to democracy. <laughs> this process was led by a coalition of parties for democracy, which is now back back in town with Michel Bachelet as uh, the new president, and they basically engaged in a in a negotiation with the military to allow peaceful transition to democracy while keeping the, the fundamental elements of the neoliberal program. They even deepened even more the neoliberal system in Chile by continuing with privatizations and the extension of the market. So this progressive coalition arrived at this compromise with the military dictatorship and thus we can understand the at least the whole process of the transition which is I would say, some, some people say it ended in 2010 with the new right-wing president, Sartian Piñera, which is now living office. Um, but it's basically, transition is basically a process of the management of the neoliberal counter-revolution of the 70s. I would say that the major impact, <coughs> or the greatest impact of this transformation, the psychological and physical attack on Chilean people and the working class, the transformation of the economy, the neoliberalization of the economy in Chile, and also the political transition slash transaction to democracy. Uh, one of its greatest, greatest impacts is deactivation, almost complete deactivation and dismemberment of the popular movement in Chile that had been very active since the 60s and, and, and strongly in the 70s, but also 
in the 60s and the 70s with a socialist perspective, but that in the 80s reorganized itself to uh, try to confront and um, fight the dictatorship, including even an attempt of assassination against Pinochet in 1986, which was sadly unsuccessful. Maybe things would have been different, I don't know. Many organizations in, in, the 80s, in the 70s and 80s were made illegal, student federations, union organizations in the neighborhoods, and all this resulted in the fragmentation of the civil society in Chile uh, with a very um, huge weakness of the social movements and of course a general apathy regarding real political issues by the people. That's the context of, of the 90s. That's, we, we start the 90s with that awful situation. Some statistics that I think are interesting to understand Chile right now. The average debt for a family in Chile is 7.5 times the minimum wage. So you get the minimum wage and you're already, you already owe 7.5 times that. The 10%, the richest 10% earns 53, 53 times uh, what the poorest 10% earns as a, as a wage, right? The income situation. But also inequality. You may have heard or read that Chile is one of the most unequal countries in Latin America and in the world. And we're, we, we look like a very developed country, but we're basically a, a, I would say, a third world country in the, the sense that we have a strong inequality. And we are, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, notion of país bananero, basically a country that exports bananas. Well, we export other, other fruits, not bananas, but we're basically a bananero country. The share of the pie earned by the richest 1% in Chile is larger than the share of the pie that is earned by the richest 1% in the US or the UK, which means that our rich people are richer than your rich people. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, of course, very proud of that. <laughs> so it's in this context, awful context of the 90s, that a new, a new social movement starts to reorganize in Chile. The working class is very weak, uh, but it starts, starts to raise its head and to fight against and resist the neoliberal program. And the, the most advanced element, the most dynamic element of that new social movement is, of course, the students. The students who, who are young don't have the same uh, trauma, the same experience of, of being victims of the dictatorship, uh, so they can organize in different ways. They all, of course, they, they are very suspicious and mistrustful of this political tradition of political parties that um, commit, uh, that compromise with the military, so they are looking for new ways to organize themselves too. And that's where the student movement comes into play, and that's what Gabriel is going to tell you about. Um, so, it is in this context of the 90s where we had very strong legacies from the dictatorship. And one of the strongest, and especially important for the student, was the organic constitutional law of education. This law, put in a head by dictatorship, but with the help of the Social Democrats, basically established that the state had no responsibility in educating its own people, and that there was only, the only role that it actually had was to supervise and to regulate this new market of education that it had opened. Basically, subsidize private institutions and leave and regulate that its own private institutions. That was a role that the dictatorship left the state with. Uh, at the same time, there was also another very important transformation. The transformation to a municipal system of education. Basically meaning that the schools will depend and will be maintained by the city halls, meaning that city halls in poor neighborhoods would have poor schools, and city halls in richer neighborhoods would have richer schools. It was a segregation system that was established for having a large outcome of workforce for this new type of economy that the dictatorship was planning, and also having, at a certain point, a little bit of professionals and bosses by the other side. So this system was a system that we were left with. A very segregated system of education and the students had to face um, different reforms that were trying to be pushed further by the same transitory governments 
to actually make more deeper the neoliberal system within the system of education. From the 90s to various years, the students entered in what we call not only a rebuilding of their movement, but also what we call a face of resistance of the movement, where they had to push further or basically resist different reforms that were coming from this neoliberal government. So in that phase, one important thing that happened, and was a bit different from the 90s mobilization, where we actually saw many of the students being basically managed by leaders that were from the same transition parties, and they were utilized as an electoral basis for um, different campaigns and different like, things like that. In 2001, a movement erupts for this type of nature of the student movement and starts to organize in a more base type of, of assemblies and having actually different assemblies for each school and from there actually having a more direct action type of way of understanding the struggle. This movement of 2001 was called El Mochilazo, basically meaning when someone kicks you with a backpack. And it was really that. It was a very different way of understanding student organizing. But still, within this phase of resisting, we need to understand that. Then, in 2011, students saw that maybe acting for the immediate things that were happening wasn't the real solution. So they wanted to attack the pillars of this whole neoliberal system within education. And they saw this organic constitutional law as a way to actually attack this. So actually, if we could demand the derogation of this law, we can actually change the whole system. And that was a very important way because they were actually analyzing how to change this whole, this whole system. And they actually got a lot of people to understand that this actually was a way, or it was something that could change the whole system. This experience of 2006, that was called the Revolution of the Penguins, well, because penguins have, well, because students have uniforms in Chile, high school students have uniforms, so they look like penguins when they march. <laughs> uh, the press is very, you know, like, they like this type of things. Yeah. <laughs> Laugh. <laughs> um, so, in that context, what you saw is that um, this was actually a movement with this demand, this idea of derogating this law, could actually form a mass movement, could actually form a movement that after um, the first, I don't know this, the first uh, presidential speech where nothing was talked about education, two weeks later, all the different schools of Chile were occupied by their students, and they had a national organization of different assemblies, of all different local assemblies in all their schools. All the schools of Chile had their local assemblies, all the different places had their local places. And from there, they started to organize in a, in a very confrontive way for various amount. The problem there was that there was still this face of resistance. And when they went to negotiate, they didn't have a proposal to actually um, confront the whole different technocratic ideas that the other type of, type of governments had at that time. And it wasn't until 2011, with a new movement, a very great movement that's united not only high school, mid school, and education and uh, elementary students that were basically the secondary students, as we call them, and it also could integrate university students. It was a movement that grew very big, and it had a new idea, a new type of idea of, of confronting this whole situation of education, basically establishing that we need to have offensive type of strategies. Understanding that we need to have a proposal, something to be a confrontation of the neoliberal project of education, our own project of education. So this idea came with the slogan of no more profit with education. The idea was to understand education as what we call a social right. A right that not only needs to be guaranteed for everyone, but also needs to be created and administrated by the people themselves. This is a very important concept because it's the concept that has can, can't be integrated in the understanding, the neoliberal understanding of education, where education is basically a service that you buy or you sell. Our understanding, that the students' understanding at this moment was that education needs to be a social right. This understanding couldn't be administrated by the system, and for there was something that could push further a new type of educational system that would actually be for the people and not for the economic law interests of the country. So, this was a very important movement. It started um, very fiercely. You could see a million people in some marches going out of the streets in a country that only has 17 million people. And we also saw 80% um, of the population in the polls supporting this movement and supporting the idea of free education. It was a very popular movement. It was very fiercely 
fighting for six, even eight, and even nine months. But still, still there was a problem. And that problem, and a very strong evaluation that we're doing, uh, especially from our side, from the revolutionary left side, from the libertarian, or left libertarian side, is the idea that the problem there was that we were students. And understanding that students, when they strike, when they occupy their buildings, they don't have any impact in the economy. We understand that the only way to have the leverage to actually force the government to negotiate and to win our demands was to actually unite with the workers. The workers that could have the leverage, the economical impact that could actually give us a way to win our demands. This was our proposal and sadly because of the unwillingness of that moment, we couldn't see that fulfill at least in 2011. Right now the students have got a lot of lessons about the movement of 2011 and we see new things arising. We see 2013 was a national day of protest where workers, dock workers, strike in 24 of the 25 ports of Chile with some mining sites striking for education, with some students going all in the mayor streets of Santiago, of the mayor cities of all the mayor cities of Chile doing barricades to actually have an impact on the economy, to stop the economy and say we're fighting for free education. And it's not just a mediatic thing. We're actually detaining and affecting your interests, the, the interests of the ruling class. So, this is the first experience that we had. It went very well. We had uh, a very good reception of the workers, of the other sectors that were participating. Not, not only workers, not only students, but also communities that were actually participating within this different um, mobilization. And from there, we're trying to push further certain ideas. So, this is what's happening, and this is the stage of the moment at the moment. Right now, um, you need to understand that this has been a whole process. A whole process that started um, with the very different type of movement, 2001, evolution to 2011, different type of ideas, and different type of political currents and political understanding of what was occurring with the students. One of those currents, one of those tendencies with us, the Libertarian Student Front. On a social political organization created in 2003 by anarchists that wanted to actually influence shape, that wanted to be what we call socially inserted within different social struggles, understanding that they needed to go to this student movement that was actually uh, had a national organization, a social organization that we could be participate of. From there, uh, from 2003 to, to the years right now, we have been different process to actually complement our different strategies, our different tactics to actually come to where we are. We basically started as every anarchist group starts. Uh, five kids in a room just listening to punk rock. <laughs> <laughs> but after the years and after actually making a very strong understanding of what was the situation with the education and elaborating strategies and tactics, not from an ideal situation, but the actual context of reality, the social, the economical, and the political reality, and given the strategies to the movement, we saw our, our, our movement grow. We see that now probably we can say we are 500 militants in a national scale and 150 <coughs> in Santiago, the mayor city of Chile. Um, this also with the idea that we are one of the most influential groups that right now have won um, the, the recent student federation elections with Melissa Sepulveda, part of the FEL, but also part of the, the, South, uh, the feminist group. This only reflecting like the way that we understand that political organizations need to be participant of social movements. And that's basically understanding that we need to do it through the base works, being in our local assemblies, not creating leaders, but creating the idea that the base, the assemblies, within the, the students' assemblies, the student unions, all the different groups, those are the ones that need to bring the power to the student movement. And with that understanding, and with students pushing further for a more spokesmanship type of a movement and a less leadership type of movement, we see right now um, a very different condition that we saw in those years in the 90s where we very had actually a very bureaucratized type of movement. Some of the perspectives that we're thinking right now and that we're trying to give to the moment as, as anarchists is one the idea of actually building what we call a popular project of education. Basically, it is understanding that if we want to propose something, it needs to be um, very meticulous on what we are actually understanding as a new project of education. And also understanding that this project can't, can't, can't come by only the students. The students are not the only ones involved with education. Education is a problem from society, and we need to solve it 
if we want to solve it for the working class, we need to actually integrate other movements to actually be participants of this. And we understand that we needed workers, we needed communities, we needed everyone together actually discussing what type of education we actually wanted and how that education should actually be seen as. Um, so one of these ideas of popular project education has been very important to push further. And actually it has been possible to do this because we have been uh, discussing these ideas with other groups of the revolutionary left that actually see this as a problem and they see that it's necessary to actually push things not only as students but as well as workers and communities. With this idea also comes the idea of what we call multi-sectorality. The idea that transversal demands, ideas like education, like free education, should be fought not only by one sector in specific, but also by different sectors that could actually give the leverage to this movement. Not only education, but also a new pension system that was totally privatized by dictatorship, a new healthcare system that was totally privatized by dictatorship. All these different things need to be fought by not only one sector, it needs to be fought by the workers, by the students, and by the communities, <coughs> by the ecological movements, by feminist movements, all together, actually understanding that we need to push things further as a working class. And all those sectors that the working class actually is. Not only within the workers, but also students, and also communities, also neighbors. At least, that's the understanding that we have of Chile in this moment. So, not only as students, but we also be participating within some labor movements, especially what we call strategic, um, strategic sectors of the economy. One of those very important is the dock workers, that anarchists have been trying to participate and actually create a national union of uh, dock workers that right now exist and have been doing different actions and different fights. Um, one very recently when they were fighting for just one half an hour of lunch in one port that didn't have that. And we actually saw solidarity strikes going all over the country because of this port. That's something that we've been contributing, this idea that we need to have solidarity, class autonomy, uh, direct action and direct democracy, that's the way that we're trying to push things further within those movements. Another sector that we participate is with, for example, within construction workers, within some community that were being organized in 2004, 2005, and other sectors. Well, the mural brigades that you see on below it, of the photos, and very recently, um, a new organization that we've been trying to push further, a new feminist, uh, an anarcho feminist organization that Elise is going to tell you a little bit about. Well, first of all, I wanted to, to uh, tell you a little bit about the background uh, uh, in Chile uh, about gender issues, because as you heard, Chilean society is fundamentally uh, capitalist and neoliberal, but also fundamentally patriarchal. Uh, and they form together a domination structure that is based on social, uh, on social relations of subordination. So, basically, it's inserted in all our interpersonal rela relationships and present in every sphere of daily life, uh, whether the public or the, pri or the private sphere. Uh, we can see it at home, uh, within the group, within the family, uh, in the workplace, in the institution, like the educational or health system, um, but also through the culture, language, the media, communication, also in politics, etc. So, for example, in Chile, uh, we have the, the more extreme uh, way of, uh, of gender violence that expresses by discrimination and gender violence. Um, for example, in 2008, a survey revealed that that 36% of the women in a relationship between uh, 18 and 65 years old had suffered violence from their partner, whether psychological, physical or sexual violence. Um, in the more extreme way of, uh, the more extreme form of uh, gender violence, um, talking about the femicide, um, that means uh, murder of a woman due to, due to, to domestic violence. Um, about that, we chill, uh, in Chile we have uh, 60 femicides that occur per, per year, uh, so that's something uh, huge. Also in Latin America, uh, one of four women had been raped uh, in their childhood. Um, 
Another huge problem we have in Chile, uh, we have a, a huge rate of child pregnancy. Um, we can see, for example, uh, um, young girls from 11, 12, 13 years old being pregnant uh, due to the lack of access to the, the means of contraception. Uh, but also, um, in Chile, we need to know that abortion still remains illegal. Although it not always has been so, because uh, before, before the dictatorship, uh, actually, um, theoretical abortion was legal. Uh, that means in the case of a risk for the mother's health or for the mother's life. Um, it was legal, but during the dictatorship, uh, they changed the law and, and made it illegal and all its forms. That means that now, if, uh, a girl or a woman uh, want to, to do an abortion, like clandestinely risking her life doing it, uh, she, she go to prison. She can have like uh, till five years of prison for that. Um, so as you see in Chile, we have a complicated situation, I guess, in the whole world, it's kind of like the same thing. Um, so, as you see, having for the second time a uh, woman president, uh, that doesn't mean that patriarchy is over at all. <laughs> that doesn't mean that we suddenly have gender equality. Opportunity. We are far from that. Um, also, I wanted to point out the fact that women uh, are the only victim of gender violence because it's also perpetrated against men, against uh, gays, lesbians, transgender, transsexual. Um, and all those who are imposed a tender of behavior uh, based on gender normative. And that's where we see uh, most of the time uh, discrimination, but also sometimes uh, violence due to gender. So when we talk about feminism, uh, also it's important to, to, um, uh, to clarify what, what we understand by feminism because there are several uh, um, several ways of understanding it, uh, several organizations that understand it differently. Uh, basically, we understand feminism as gender equality. Um, that's why uh, we understand that it's uh, the emancipation for the people who are oppressed by their gender or sex condition. It doesn't mean that it's, for us, it doesn't mean at least that it's the contrary of machismo or, the, or that we want, to, we want women to dominate men or something like that. So, uh, also, we include men in our organization. Uh, so we think that feminism must be uh, something that uh, must be a struggle uh, needed by all the people, not only by women. Um, also, we don't want only like gender equality as a right, but uh, we want to change the whole domination structure. Uh, that subdue, subjugate some gender categories uh, and social classes to exploitation and oppression. That's why we think that feminism can't exist without a social political perspective. We can't only talk about gender.